We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill its heart with thy love. May its soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thy new glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy new glory. Revive us again. And let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that Again, we can gather together and sing your praises. And Lord, we, we do want to praise you. And Lord, I pray that you would um, lift us up this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be with our classes all over our building. Lord, that you would bless there, bless the, the, the teachers and the students. And then, Lord, I pray that you would be with our missionaries all over this world. You give them a special blessing this morning be with them. And then, Lord, I pray that you would bless our offering we're about to partake for them. And we'll ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lee. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hopefully everybody's doing good this fine morning with the rain we've had. So, Brother Don's passing around the plate for the offering that we support, uh, for the missionaries that we support, I guess I should say. Uh, down below there, you can see on the bottom, missionary supported during Sunday school. So the offerings for this time upstairs here and downstairs go to those missionaries, uh, the missionaries above, plus I think there's probably about uh, almost 30 or so that we support during our, our faith giving, missionary giving, um, which is out of our, normally during our time of, uh, during the service. Anyways, we're going to start with, uh, <clears throat> start again and looking at uh, the occupations that we've been going through, and today we're going to be looking at the potter or a potter. Of course, when we're talking about a potter, we have a verse up here, uh, Isaiah 64, 8, which we'll be looking at in a little, little bit. bit. But, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay, and thou art our pot, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Boy, I'm having a tongue-tied this morning <laughs> for whatever reason. Mouth is dry. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get, get started in our lesson. Our Father, we do thank you for this time you've given us, Lord, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you for your word. pray now, Lord, that you help me, Father, that uh, you just bring some new words to my mouth this morning, Lord, and that you would try to get some meaning and sense to this this passage. If you didn't get a copy of the notes, they're back there on the back table. And uh, so the potter, a potter, what is a potter? Well, when you think about a potter as somebody who takes some clay or whatever material and they're going to form some type of an item, whether it be a plate or a bowl or, or a cup. I certainly have a couple of things at home that were made by uh, this guy that, that, work, that I worked with, and uh, his wife did a lot of pottery. And so for Christmas, he would give out these different items out of a cup that I had from him and a nice little bowl. You know, some of those things that they make are, we're going to look at in just for a minute, you know, they were made to, especially back in the day, not a whole lot today so much, but they were made for cooking, and they were made for eating and drinking, but then there were also those items that were made for refuge, you know, something you'd put in there and you toss it out the window or whatever the case may be, so there were different things that were made by these potters. And I don't know about you, but I, there's, especially where I used to live, Back in California, there was a lot of orchards and things there where we lived, and most of the soil there was clay. And I mean, this clay was as hard as rock. Maybe some of you, we don't have a whole lot out here. It's mostly sand, but anyways, this clay was hard as rock. You, you couldn't put a shovel into it, and so what we'd do to do any kind of digging or anything in there, we would just kind of soak it. You know, we'd just turn the sprinkler on, let it soak for about, you know, 10 years or something like that to kind of loosen it up, and then we could get in there, and you could kind of actually dig it, and then you'd kind of dig it up and maybe then put some topsoil on it so you could actually get something to grow in it. But when that clay got wet... 
you, then it would be just, you'd walk in it, it would stick to your boots, you know, and you'd like, I remember one time I was, I was down with my dad once someplace, and it's getting off the side. Anyway, down, at the, down he, was, he was a geologist, and, and they were draining a, um, a reservoir, and they were going to take down a dam. And I was about 12, 13. I didn't know any better. I got down in there, got in that clay, and I had my boots on, and I was like, I got stuck in this stuff, and finally, my boots stayed in there. I walked out of that place, my, basically my socks, my dad, where's your boots? They're down in the mud, Dad. But that's clay, you know, real sticky stuff, but it really, when, it, when you get it like that, then you can mold it and you can shape it into things, and then, they, and then it starts to dry, and as it dry, it gets hard, and they put it in ovens, and they fire it, and then they, they put some glaze on it or whatever and make some really, you know, beautiful pots. And that's kind of what we're looking at in a couple of pictures that I have up here, of course. You have the clay that a uh, person starts out with on the sign there, and he puts it on his wheel, starts spinning that wheel, and he forms the pot and ends up making a real, you know, beautiful piece of pottery out of it. And we look at that verse, and we start taking a look at it just from the perspective of a potter. What is a potter? Uh, the definitions there. Actually, the Hebrew word there, it's, I put that up there because it's kind of important because there's a couple of different words that, that this, this Hebrew word is translated into. So it kind of helps us understand what this means. So if you look at that, it means basically just the word potter there in, in that verse of Isaiah means to mold or to, into a form. So basically, just like what we would think, right, is that they're taking something and they're molding it into a form. As you go on to it... Um, it also has the, has the um, idea to, to determine something, right? Because you're taking a piece of lump of clay or dirt or soil or whatever, you're adding water to it, moisture to it, and then they're taking it, and it's nothing. But the idea, the potter has an idea of what he or she wants to make. I want to make a cup. Okay, well, this, I'm going to take this lump of clay, and before you know it, they have a nice cup, and they fire that thing up, and then they either use it for their own, own, own purposes or they sell it but they've determined what they want to do with that clay. And so that's what that, that idea of a potter um, kind of has that idea. When you look at Webster's definition there, one whose occupation is to make earthen vessels. Pretty simple. It's kind of profound, right? Potter, you know, just making earthen vessels. And then the idea of work there has, it's a, much richer meaning when you look at it than just what we think of work. You know, work may be something where you're putting energy into something to get something to move, okay? That could be work. But also the idea that, you know, I go out and Monday through Friday, I have a job and I, I go to work. I do something, some service, or I'm reading documents or, or, or preparing proposals or whatever, but that's work. This has a much, kind of much richer meaning it's from the word, the root word actually for the word there, this is, it means to make in this case. So it has the idea of this work is actually you're making or producing something. So it goes right along with the idea of what a potter is doing. He's producing something. He's making something. As you go on, it's an action, generally a transaction, and an abstractly activity by implication, a product or property which I think is also interesting. So it has kind of all this rich meaning when you look at this word work because it's here it has the idea of somebody that's doing some kind of action to something, in this case, making a pot, and that pot, when he's done with it or she's done with it, it's their property. It's, they have the right to do with it what they want. They're either going to use it for their own use in the home, like I said, a cup or a plate or a bowl, or they're, gonna, they're producing all these things so that then they can sell them sell them for somebody else who's then that becomes their property and then they can do what they want. So that's kind of what the idea of what we're talking about, about a potter here. So the first verse there, Isaiah 64, 8, but now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, thou art our potter, right? So he's our potter, he's made us. We are all the work of thy hand. As you move on, Glenn will need a little bit of help here. Uh, we look at the verse from Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 goes on a little further. Romans chapter 9, 21, as we think about God being our potter and we being the clay, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make 
one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor. Got some pictures of different types of pottery that was used back in the day. So this is things that were um, actually excavated out, especially the ones on the left and on the right. The ones in the middle are a little bit more modern, but kind of a, a representation of what was done back in the time of Jesus' day or even earlier back in the time of Israel. The one on the far right is actually a lamp, right? That's what, what a lamp would have looked like. They would have put the oil in there and, and then lit the one little small end. So let's take a look at that. When we're thinking about the idea of a potter, what does some of these terms mean? Well, power, so the potter hath power over the clay. That idea of power means ability. They have ability over the clay. They have some ability, some skill that they're going to take this lump of clay. They have in their idea of what they want to do, and they have the skill and the ability then to produce whatever the product is that they're producing or working on. And it also literally means, has a literal meaning of privilege, which is really interesting when you think about that word power is also the idea of privilege. That person, again, who's making this item has the privilege over, over this particular item. The power of authority or influence, this is from, so the first part there is actually from Strong's, and then as you get into Webster's, Webster goes more into more detail. The power of authority or influence, the power of right or privilege, the power of choice, and the power of rule or government. So it has kind of those types of things in there. We've got some verses that go along with that that, that kind of help us understand this. Matthew 28, 18 through 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That idea of all power there, the sense is authority. Jesus has been given that authority by his Father over all things. And he has that authority then to send us forth, baptizing and teaching and, and discipling people as you go forth. John 1.12 but as many as received him to them, he gave the power to become the sons of God. The sense in the, that he gave us the right because of what Jesus has done. And then we humbled ourselves and, and, and cried out to him to, be, you know, to forgive us of our sins and, and to save us. So he gave us the right then to become the sons of God or the privilege, the sons of God. That idea has that meaning there. Acts 3 or Acts 5, 3, 4, Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While, whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Uh, own power, uh, why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? And so the idea there is that, you know, Ananias, you, you own this property. The property was yours. You had the right to do whatever you wanted to with this piece of property. You could keep on it. Nobody would have judged you for keeping it. You could have sold it and kept the money 100%. Nobody would have judged you for selling that piece of property and keeping the money for some other means that maybe you had to supply your family. But instead, what you did was you sold it, which was okay. You got the money, which was okay. But the problem is... Then you lied about what you were going to do with that money. Well, we only got this much for it. And you ultimately lied to the Holy Spirit. But it was in his power to do whatever he wanted to with that. He had the right because he was the owner of that piece of property. Romans 13, 1, let every, subject, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. The idea that they're talking about there, of course, is civil rule or government. So the power is there. Colossians 1, 13 through 14, whoever... Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? The idea is dominion. So then you get kind of a sense of what that idea of what power means in all these different types of applications. Of course, then you could go and you could take a look at Romans 6 and Ephesians chapter 2. We won't go there, but you can pull those up and see how those work in with that verse of Colossians. So that's the idea of power then. So we have our verse, hath not the potter the power and it kind of encompasses all these things. And then the idea of honor means a valuing by which a price is fixed. So there is some item here that's, a, that's given some value. And we look at that now and we say, you know, especially nowadays, I, I see this. I bought, I bought a truck back in 20, 2021, 2021, yeah, 2021. And uh, I paid so much for it. 
Now, if I was to sell that truck, even though I've got 30 some odd thousand miles on it, I could probably sell it for the same price I bought it for. The value is actually increased just because of the demand that's out there. So there's some value placed on it. It's not worth more than what I paid for it, but right now, because of the value, because of the way things are going. Another thing, another thing that I have is, I meant to bring this, I have a, I have a baseball that's sitting on my, sitting on my, uh, um, on my desk. You know, you just look at it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a baseball. What did it cost? Maybe the value of that, if I was out and bought it, is maybe five bucks, three to five bucks, whatever it is, right? So just a baseball, three to five. But there's something important about that ball. That ball has a, a name on it has a signature on it. It's actually Carl Yaskrimski. So you've got Carl Yaskrimski, he's a baseball player, former professional baseball player, played for the Boston, um, Boston Red Sox. So now that value has gone from five bucks up to, if I was to go online and look for it, uh, it probably may be worth $20. But I place a higher value on it because of where it came from. My wife, um, my wife's father, so my father-in-law, uh, his sister was married, I got to follow this, right? So my father-in-law's sister was married to Carl Yaskrimski's brother, right? And so there was one time when my wife was a little bit younger, she was in high school, and they all, and, and Carl Yaskrimski, Boston was in town in Pittsburgh, and they were playing a game, and so uh, my father-in-law, mother-in-law, my, my wife, Shelly, they were all going to go out to lunch, and, and, she, and his sister and and husband came along, and then Carl and his wife came along. So they all sat there and ate lunch. And so when Shelly and I got married, I was talking about some of my favorite baseball players going up, and of course, Willie Mays was the first, and then Carl Yaskrimski. And she goes, man, that name sounds really familiar. Yeah, I said, yeah, he played for the Boston Red Sox. Ding, ding. So I get a Christmas present one time. I open up a Christmas present. It's a little tiny box. I look at it and say, oh, wow, it's a baseball. That's great. You know, thanks, hon, for the baseball. She goes, well, open it. And I said, open it up. Yeah, I picked it up. When I picked it up, yeah, nice. What am I going to do with this? I turn around, Carl Yaskrimski. So she called her dad. Her dad called sister. Sister called Carl's wife. Carl signed a ball and sent it to me. That ball now, it was $5. With Carl Yaskrimski, maybe 20 But to me, it's priceless, yeah. right? I'm not selling that ball because, not just because of the name, but it's because what my wife did, you know, for me to get that ball. And so that has the idea. Um, Let's talk loud as I can here. Exalted, rank, or place, distinction. So some verses that go along with this, and of course this first one is a little bit interesting. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor. So in other words, the people did not esteem him, and they treated him with disrespect or contempt in his own country. Romans 12, 10, 12, 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor. So we're to value, we're to esteem others, right? So we're to value others, preferring one another. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Jesus was highly esteemed. High, to the highest position, exalted to the highest degree. Matthew 26, 27, 6, And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for us, for it is not lawful to, uh, for to put them into the treasury, the silver pieces, because it is, what, the price of blood. So that price is the same word as honor there. It's esteemed value. You know, when we think about it, we're talking about value. And then you look at this, this next verse right down, 1 Corinthians six twenty four. You are bought with a price. Uh, that's a cost paid to redeem man. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. And then 1 Peter says, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious. That word precious is the same word. So here we have the here we have, we're talking about value of something. We have the chief priest who paid 25 pieces of silver for Jesus, right? That was all, that was all they really thought Jesus was worth, you know, in, in you know, basically getting him arrested. But to us that are saved, he's, he's priceless. He's precious in our sight, right? His value is way beyond anything that we can compare to. How ironic that is that the chief priests didn't know their their own Messiah. And then dishonor. Dishonor means to reproach or disgrace, shame. Webster's put whatever constitutes a stain or blemish in the reputation. 
to treat with indignity, indignity, to refuse to decline and accept or pay. So the idea there at the end there to, refu- to decline or refuse, accept to pay, if somebody, if somebody handed you a note and you're saying, I'm not going to honor that. You did, you did something that I didn't give you authorization to do. I've had a client tell me that before. It's not very pleasant to go through, by the way. And then he's like, okay, I've got to write that down. So fortunately, that doesn't happen all the time. But they refused or declined to play, and that's dishonored that, that thing. A couple verses that go with that. 2 Timothy 2.20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. That idea, it, it can mean kind of a couple of different things. It can mean... If you're talking about honor and dishonor, of course, we know from, from Corinthians talking about there are some vessels that are, there, there are some gifts that are more honorable and some that are less honorable or dishonorable. Those ones that we tend to hide, they're smaller, but they're still significant in the body of Christ. The other idea that it could have is that in, a whole, in the whole, there are, there are people that are saved and are serving the Lord, and then there are, there are also people that could be in the church that we need to be careful of that are sheep and are wolves in sheep's clothing, if you, if you will be. They come in and they disrupt. They bring heresies into the church. And so we need to be careful that we don't get, involved, that we don't get caught up in those heresies. So a couple of different types of ideas that could come out of that. And the other idea is that, you know, we could be, we could, you know, we could be saved. I could, you know, I know the Lord is my Savior, and I'm either using my vessel to honor the Lord I'm obeying him, I'm following him, I'm allowing him to lead and teach me and, and to strengthen me. And when I make a mistake or when I sin, then I'm, you know, I, I turn to him and I admit that sin and I ask for his forgiveness. But then there's also the sense that I can bring reproach upon my Lord Jesus Christ with my words, with my actions. And so we need to be careful that we don't become a stumbling block to those who are outside or bring reproach upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.21, I speak as concerning reproach, that's to treat with indignity as though we had been weak, and in Romans 1.26, for this cause God gave them up to vile. All these words here mean, basically are the same Greek word that's translated um, dishonor there, whatever, so dishonor and then um, reproach and then also vile, so you kind of get the idea or the sense of what the writer is talking about there. So, God's our potter. That's what we looked at that verse, right? It says, it doesn't just say God is the potter, right? He's our potter. He's my potter. He's your potter. He's everybody's potter. He's created us. And over there in Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed. That word formed, I put that up there, is the same word as that we see in Isaiah. That's potter. So basically, he's talking about the same thing here, right? And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Boy, that sounds just like clay, doesn't it? Right? It's clay. That's basically what we have, right? Clay is is basically the dust of the ground, very fine particles. Um, And breathed into his nostrils the breath, breath of life, and man became a living soul. So when we think about the idea of a potter and the clay, we want to first off take a look at what does it mean when we think about or how should we understand what this idea of what a what God is as our potter, and what should be our responsibility then because of that. Well, first off, we know that God formed, right? And if you go back, of course, he created all things. So the Lord created man. He is the potter. We are the clay. Because he'd done that, he has the right to set the ground rules, if you say, right? Or the standards, right? God's standards, especially when we think about salvation, God's standard, we've fallen way short of that, of God's standard of righteousness. That's right. And that's why we need a Savior. He set that ground. We don't have the right to say, no, Lord, wait a minute. I, you know, um, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, I do good things, good deeds. I come to church. I, I supply money to these needs. You know, I go and I help people build, you know, buildings and stuff. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty, you know, righteous compared to some of the other people who don't really do anything. But that's not God's standard, right? He did, that's not God's guideline for, for righteousness. He has the right to set the ground rules for righteousness, as is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, 
It's Romans 3.23. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that's Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. Romans 5.19. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, right? And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10, 9 through 10. Most of us are probably very familiar. This is part of what you might call Romans Road. You can use these verses to help people understand what God's standard of righteousness really is. And that in and of ourselves, we are not righteous. We need Christ's righteousness. And that's why he came. So he has the right to set the ground rules for righteousness. When you think about righteousness, you can really open that right up because you can say, well, right, it's God sets the standard for what is right and what is not right, right? God sets the standard for what is good and what is not good. And God sets the standard for all those things as we look at that. So not only is he right to set the ground rules for righteousness, but he also has... The, the right to set the ground rules for what? For salvation. God's plan of salvation. The world is going to say, you know, there's multiple ways to get to heaven, right? There's multiple isms out there and multiple cults and all these other things, and all of them have different ways to get to heaven. But God set the standard. He set the ground rules for salvation, That's right. right? And when you look at it, John 3, 3, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus questioned him in the evening, Jesus answered and said unto him, Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be what? Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of heaven. That's God's standard. His guidance for salvation is right there. You've got to be, you must be born again. There was a time where I didn't know, I, I think I may have shared this before, I didn't know what that meant. Sitting on a ski lift, a guy asked me, are you born again? I don't know. I thought I was saved, but I wasn't. I had no idea what born, being born again meant until I read it, until the Lord opened up my eyes and helped me understand. Um, and as Moses, and then moving on down to verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Way back in the Old Testament, God set, started setting the standard, the type of what Jesus Christ, what the Messiah was going to do. He was going to go to the cross, shed his blood on the cross, and die for our sins, and then he's going to rise again. That's part of his plan of salvation. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent, his, sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Amen. Jesus is the only way. Amen. There's a lot of people that say, wow, that's a very narrow, narrow-minded view. Very intolerant. You're absolutely right. But that's, this is God's standard, right. right? And he has, as he is the potter, He's the creator. He has the right to set the standard and the guidance and the guidelines. Not us. It's not up to us to make any changes to what his plan of salvation is, to add to it or to delete from it. So, right to do righteousness, salvation, and also for our daily living. The words that they are used typically that we see are the idea of vocation, not just the job, and then also conversation, right? Those are kind of the two words that we see in a couple of these verses up here. They don't mean just conversation the way I'm doing right now, but it's our daily living, our daily way of life. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you have a walk worthy of the vocation. There's that word there. Wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing, uh, one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bonds of peace. So you re that's, that's, God has set that ground rule, if you will, that we have a vocation or we have a lifestyle that's worthy of our calling, of his calling of us. Amen. And part of that, 
part of that that he set is that we would live in, with lowliness and meekness, humility, that we'd be humble, that we would forbear one another, that we'd be patient with one another, forgiving one another, and then we would also keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. One thing we want to be careful is that in those things like that, when we, we stray away from God's plan of doing it, whatever it is, whether it's righteousness or salvation or whether it's our daily lifestyle, we potentially become a stumbling block to the people that are around us. And we become possibly a reproach to the name of our Lord Jesus when we start making changes to things. That's why it's really important that we be in the scripture and we not change anything in the word of God so that we don't become that approach or that stumbling block. So the Lord has created man. He has a right to set the ground rules, but also he has the right to receive glory because he's, he created everything. He's God. He's the only God, the true God. He's created everything. Psalm 139, 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. That's David talking there. Isaiah 43, 7, even everyone that is called by thy, my name, for I have created him for my glory. That's what we were created. Part of where we were created was to glorify God our Father Amen. in heaven, to bring him glory. And when we're following his, his leadership, when we're following his plan for righteousness and for salvation, for daily life, we're going to bring glory to the Father. So, uh, receive glory. He also has the power and authority to save sinners. Amen. Praise the Lord, right? He didn't just leave us there. He didn't just, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, he just, okay, pff, wiping everything out and going to start all over. You know, he had a plan to save mankind. A couple verses. David really fully understood this. Psalm 51, 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David realized that he couldn't create a a clean heart in his life, that it required the power of God working in and through him to give him that clean heart, that upright heart. Romans 1, 16 through 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and, to, and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness, there's that word again, of God revealed from faith to faith, that is written, just shall live by faith. We could have used part of this verse for that idea of righteousness. But it shows the power of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us. He hath made, that's God the Father, made Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that's Jesus knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This verse right here is an incredible verse. This is one, one of my life verses right here. This is one of my favorite verses, the base, part, base of my salvation on that verse right there. Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his glory of the inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that's working in us right now. It's the same power we have, the promise, the hope that one day he's going to raise us up. If the Lord, if I was to die today, I believe my hope, in other words, I, I, my expectation is what Jesus said. By the power of God, he's going to raise me up and I'm going to be in heaven with him for eternity. Amen. It's the power of God. Ephesians 2, 1, 1 and 5, verses 1 and 5. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Amen. Amen. Other section of verses right there that are my life verses. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And then that. It's good verses. So, he has the right to receive glory. He has the power and authority to save sinners. And then also, he has the ability to provide wisdom and understanding. He has the ability to provide not just any wisdom, the wisdom of this world, because the wisdom of this world is really foolishness. You know, we've, we look at it, you see it all over the place, from quote-unquote what the experts say, quote-unquote what the scientists say, quote-unquote to what the teachers say. A lot of that stuff is foolishness compared to 
the wisdom and understanding that our Lord has. Why? He created everything. He knows it. He knows our frame, too, when we think about it, right? And he knows what we're capable of. He knows he gives us, what, an escape. He doesn't put us into any position that he doesn't allow us an out, right? Because he knows our frame. He knows our weaknesses. In fact, where we're, we're weak, he is strong, as it says in there. So he knows those weaknesses. When we talk about the ability to provide wisdom and understanding, Psalm 119, 73 the hands, thy hands hath made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Proverbs 2, 3 through 6. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifted up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19. We kind of looked at this, but there were three things that kind of Paul states in here that he would like us to have knowledge of, to have understanding and those things there. Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened. What? That you may know what is the hope of his calling. He wants us to know that. What's the hope of his calling? That also, uh, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. He wants us to know these things. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? James 1, 5 through 6, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven um, with the wind and tossed. Notice what it says there. There's a condition there. When we ask God, he's going to, we're asking God for wisdom. I'm, I, there's been times where I've asked the Lord, give me some wisdom. Even, you know, preparing a Sunday school lesson or whatever it is or purchasing something, give me understanding. But notice what to say. The condition is we're asking in faith, right? We're asking in faith. Okay. So the other thing, too, then we look at it. The, the idea that the Lord has created us, and there's the idea that goes along with this of being a potter is that idea of creating and also making us. Psalm 103, 100 verse 3 says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The Lord made men, again, he is the potter, we are the clay, therefore... What? We should serve him. When you look at that, if you want to open up, you can open up to that Psalm 100 there. But basically all this comes, the next few things come right out of Psalm 100. First off, because he's made us, because he's the potter, we're the clay, and he's the Lord, and he's made us. Our, our role is we should serve him. Psalm 103, verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thee. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us. So we're to serve him, not just serve him out of, oh, man, I got to do this. It's my duty, especially you know, when I was a kid, you know, I had to take out the trash. Man, I hated taking out the trash. And it always seemed like I'd forget, and it'd be like 9 o'clock at night or whatever. My mom, get out there, and I'm watching my favorite show. Mom, come on. But I had to do it. It was part of my service around the house, right? Clean up the bedroom. Man, I hated cleaning up my bedroom. Just shove everything under the bed, right? My mom would look under the bed. No, you're not clean. You got to clean it up, right? Hated doing that. No, that's not what this is. This is a father that we're serving that loves us. He created us. He made us. He's given us heavenly blessings. He's blessed us beyond we can or imagine. He saved us. He's redeemed us. He's purchased us. Not only did he make us, but he redeemed us. He bought us out of the um, slavery of sin. Man, he's worthy for us to serve him, to walk with him. We should serve him. Therefore, because he made us, we should serve him. We should also be thankful. We should thank him, right? If you continue on looking at verses 3 through 4, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Be thankful. Enter his gates. I mean, maybe we could even say here, What's your mindset when you come in to worship the Lord? Is it a mindset of being thankful? I mean, that enter the gates could be a lot of different things, but if you take it just as meaning enter into his temple gates, 
entering into the gates of the city, whatever it is that we're entering in, we ought to be thankful in all those things. And then also, so we should serve him, we should thank him, we should praise him. Same, come right out of verse 4 there. Enter into his gates and his courts with praise. So again, coming in here, coming or wherever we're going, but especially when we're talking about coming in to worship, what is, again, our mindset? A mindset of thankfulness, a mindset to serve, and a mindset to praise him, to lift up his name, to glorify him, to thank him for the things that he's done. And then also, we should bless him. That idea of bless means to ascribe honor, acknowledge and glorify the Lord. So we get that, that again. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise and be thankful and bless his name. Honor his name. Lift up his name. So, Lord made man. Therefore, we should serve him, we should thank him, we should praise him, we should bless him. All those are found in this, that one, those few verses. We continue on. Why? Because he is good. That idea of good there, when you're looking at it there, means benevolent, kind, merciful, and gracious. That comes right out of Webster's. Psalm 100, 3 through 4, if we won't go down, but it basically down at the end there, verse 4 says, for the Lord is good. The Lord is good. He's um, uh, kind and uh, and merciful, gracious, all that goes into being good. Not only is that, not only is he good, but he's also merciful. He's merciful. That idea of merciful means compassionate, tender, disposed to pity offenders and to forgive them their offenses. Boy, the Lord certainly is merciful to all of us. He's been merciful to all of us. And there he's saying, for the Lord is good, his mercy is what? It's everlasting. Yeah. It's an everlasting mercy. And then also, he is faithful, firm in adherence to truth, constant and worthy of belief. And you get down there, for the Lord is good, he is merciful, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth through all generations. In other words, it's, his truth is going to stand firm. That's why we can trust the word of God, right? Because he's faithful. His promises he's made, he's going to keep those promises. He's not... This, this word, so we can trust what this word says because the Lord's truth endureth to all generations. And we think about how old the Bible is. So, uh, the Lord has made us, therefore we should serve him, thank him, praise him, bless him. He is good, merciful, and faithful. But then kind of on the opposite side, the thing we do need to be careful about, because he's made us, because he's our creator, because he's the potter and we're the clay, we really don't have the right to, um, to uh, what did I say up here? <laughs> question his authority. My mind went blank. We don't really have the right to question his authority or his design. Jeremiah 8, or actually Isaiah 45, 9, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the posture strive with the potsherds of the earth, Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. So the Lord's fashioned us, therefore we don't have really the right to question his authority. The Lord has the right. He has all authority, and what he says, you know, we should, we should take by faith and follow along. But also, not only his authority, but his design. Man, his design. When you think about just your, your own body, the design in the, in, in the human body is absolutely miraculous. It's amazing. And what it's designed to do. And so we need to be careful because especially nowadays, there are a lot of people out there that are, have come to this idea that God didn't design me right. You know, I should be this. And I can choose to be. That's wrong. That's, right. that's going against God's authority, against his word, against his design. But also his design for salvation. His design of righteousness and holiness, and you can go on and on and on. So, uh, Jeremiah 18, 5 through 6 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, that's Jeremiah saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so ye are in mine hand, O house of Israel. And then we'll finish up with this. Not only, therefore, we don't have the right to question his authority or design, 
but we don't have the right to accuse him of being unwise, unknowing, or unfair. So we need to be careful of that. Isaiah 29, 16, this is interesting. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed in the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? And in other words, and it's interesting because surely you're turning things upside down is, is, is those two words right there in the, in the Hebrew, and it means the surely is a very demonstrative language. You know, it's very strong language that he's using there. And then the second part of that means to be upset or perversity. Uh, Webster kind of puts it this way. They were perverting all things. They were perverting all things. They were basically turning everything upside down. Instead of saying, no, you created me. You have the right and the authority over my life, right? They were saying, I'm the clay, but I, I don't agree with how you made me, Lord. I don't agree with your authority, Lord. I don't agree with your word. I don't agree. This doesn't, this doesn't sound right in this day and age. Lord, you are so intolerant of all these other views and opinions. That's basically what he's kind of getting to. Israel had no just views of the truth. They had twisted the truth. Very similar to what... Uh, the serpent did in the garden, right? Hath God really said? You start to question. And what happened was when he said that, Eve then starts to, wow, you know, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's not right. And if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap, right? Just twist it just a little bit. Um, Israel treated the law as mere formality. They just were going through the motions at that time. We also need to be careful that we don't treat our worship service. We don't treat our time with the Lord as just mere formality. Oh, I, I, I want to get through the Bible in one year. That's great. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. But I know in my own personal life when I did that, it almost became formality. Oh, I, I, I got to do this. Well, that's not why you read the Bible. So you can get through it. So you can say, yeah, I, did, I read the Bible in a year. That's not the purpose of that. It's great to read the Bible all the way through. But there's a purpose for why we're reading and studying the Word of God. And that's to allow it to change us and to mold us, right, as the potter molds the clay, to become and conform to more to our Lord Jesus Christ. Israel attempted to conceal their plans from the Lord. They thought they could hide their plans from the Lord. But the Lord, the Lord knows our hearts, our minds, and our hearts, of course, as Jeremiah says, is desperately wicked who can know our hearts. So we do need to be careful of that. The Lord is a potter. We're the clay. We need to allow him to work in our lives to change us and to help us to become more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you again for this time you've given us this morning to look into your word and to look at many different passages, but especially focus upon you as, as our creator, our maker, the potter, Lord. Help us, Father, to, to um, come before you with a humble heart, willing to serve, willing to obey, and, Father, willing to uh, love one another as you've called us to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.